print quick. Então, é, eu estou vendo só nós aqui. E o... Ah, depois que eu apresentar, você abre, entendi. Não tem um segundo microfone? Zé, tem um microfone só? Aqui eu estou vendo um só. É, porque aí eu deixo esse para você. Ok, Tá para lá e a gente começa. Bom, vamos começar então. Boa tarde a todos e todas. Hoje a gente vai ter aqui uma conversa, uma mesa com dois convidados. É... A primeira vai ser a professora Olga Russinova e depois a gente vai ter o professor Jacopo Galimberti. Eu propus aí como termo um pouco genérico para a mesa, né? Vanguarda e arte de vanguarda e política na Guerra Fria, porque ambos vão trabalhar de questões relativas à relação entre arte e política e a contextos de vanguarda nesse período pós-56, né? Então, sobretudo no período pós-desestalinização. Nós vamos começar, então, com a professora Olga. A Olga Rucinova, que era professor, foi professora durante muitos anos então, na Escola Superior de Economia de Moscou e está agora conosco aqui no Brasil e na Unicamp como pesquisadora visitante, é, sendo recebida tanto por mim aqui no Programa de História da Arte quanto pelo professor é, Omar Tomás na Antropologia. Ela é especialista, sobretudo, é, em vanguarda, em, de vanguarda, desculpa, de volta, com vanguarda na cabeça, Espe, especialista, sobretudo, em escultura, né, no, no, no âmbito do, dos diferentes domínios das artes, sendo publicado um livro sobre as esculturas monumentais é, em Leningrado, ou São Petersburgo, é, nesse mesmo período do qual nós estamos tratando aqui e está desenvolvendo nesse momento uma pesquisa sobre o retorno da vanguarda, né, o que eles chamam de segunda vanguarda, no contexto desse contexto que eu falei da desestalinização, né, então como uma nova, é, uma retomada do passado de vanguarda soviético que aparece em contraposição ao realismo socialista após a desestalinização. É a pesquisa que ela está desenvolvendo aqui conosco, está começando a desenvolver aqui conosco, com um farto material que ela trouxe da Rússia, é, e entendo que o que ela vai apresentar para nós hoje é um, um, um primeiro resultado, uma primeira parte dessa pesquisa, também trabalhando sobre a questão especificamente da escultura. Eu estou fazendo a apresentação da professora Olga em português, porque é a nossa língua, e porque também a professora compreende um pouco, tendo sido também já pesquisadora é, visitante em Lisboa, mas ela vai fazer a apresentação dela em inglês, tá? Para os nossos dois convidados, a língua que acordamos será a língua inglesa. Vou passar então a palavra para a professora Olga. Muito obrigado. Thank you, Olga. Uh, you have thank you for being here with us, presenting the beginning of this research, and we are all anxious to hear. Well, are you listening to me? Me, me, this one. I do. Yes. Um, is it okay now? Okay. Um, good day to everybody. Thank you for inviting me here. And in my presentation, I'm going to say what was inside Soviet Union during the period of the Cold War. 
I focus on the late Soviet time, precisely the long 60s. We are used to thinking about this time as modernization, scientific, technical revolution, cosmos, Sputnik, all these things. So why indeed a wooden sculpture that by its very nature doesn't fit into any modernization? Note that the title refers to what was marginalized in the Soviet art, not only wooden sculpture, but also late Soviet avant-garde, which was doubly humiliated, first and foremost, by the state with its ideological control, so-called struggle against formalism, and secondly, by the artists themselves. It was about the control of the, over the two. Uh, the next, please. Here we see uh, the dictionary definitions of the third term from the title, the artifice. And from these definitions, we can conclude that the artifice can be, first, a clever tactics, in our case, a tactics of resistance to the false unanimity imposed by the state. At least let's take it as a starting political point. Then it is about being unnoticed, as if it were not resistance at all. And finally, it is about the skills and the art which help to continue the way or achieve the aims. In terms of Michel Dissertot, these are all practices of the artifice available within a field of power. I will focus on these three perspectives to show how this works and how it makes the world much more complex. We'll start from the resistance to the unanimity. The second avant-garde flourished in response for the ideological modernization in the mid-50s after 30 years of socialist realism of Stalin time. The next, please. In Stalinist system of total unfreedom, there were very few who remained in harmony with themselves in their art and moral principles. In contrast, the quote from Lydia Ginsburg is about how the majority of people, and above all artists, experience that time. Three years after Stalin's death, the new state leader presented a shocking report, the next please, denouncing the cult of personality and the return to Lenin principles. Curiously, this concept was based on apparent asynchrony. To put it simple, Lenin died in 1924. His past should become now the Soviet present. However, historical science was helpless here, the next place, in terms of informing people. Everybody understood that it continued to serve the ideology and omitted facts to support communist dogmas. Here you can see two departments of an ordinary bookstore in a provincial city of Murom. And you can compare the overcrowded department of technical literature and the absolutely empty department of historical literature and political sciences. Therefore, uh, the next place, in the long 60s, the task of reconstructing the past fell to artists, not historians. With them, the declared return of image of Lenin restored the zeitgeist of the 20s. The artists would ask, I quote, we talk about the new modern art all the time. Can we have the new which does not take us back to the 20s? And that is all our young people are talking about. Give them the 20s. End of quotation. 
I suppose that it was the sanctioned appeal to press talent past that influenced the interest boosting the band avant-garde and new experiments, a genius out of the jug that could not be driving back in. That's why the Soviet art of the 60s associated itself with the art of the period before Stalin, and it was the way to negate the official socialist realism. From the mid-50s on, the early avant-garde in its different forms attracted the attention of the Soviet artists in addition to their own experiments. The return of the forgotten art cha challenged conservatives, and in turn it helped artists of the younger generation to realize its value, both artistic and ideological. The concept of the second avant-garde thus includes, first of all, an idea of the once existing link between early revolutionary art and politics, the break of this link during Stalin and its restoration. Uh, the next, please. To remind shortly, during the revolution and the following decade, many artists actively supported the new government, especially futurists and constructivists. Then the discussions about artistic principles turned into political accusations and resulted in physical repressions. First, of course, of futurist and constructivist artists. The next, please. Then of many others and shutdown of the famous Futimas school to say the Russian Bauhaus. In the early 30s, the Communist Party closes all art associations. The diversity in art was done away with in favor of socialist realism. This also secured for the state the system of art management in cities and regions and set the state monopoly on art. The next place. Um, Union of Artists, formerly public organization, was established. You can see the enormously large bureaucratic structure between the ideological power of the Communist Party and uh, artists and people as a public. It legalized the work of artists in exchange for loyalty. The most sinister feature of the union was its compulsory nature. Only by becoming a member could an artist acquire the right to professional activity, to exhibitions and even to distributing of materials. At that time, the government founded the Committee for the Arts, a body of control and censorship for socialist realism. The memory of the early avant-garde had to disappear. In the post-war period, and since the beginning of the Cold War, the struggle against formalism was reinforced. In the early 50s, by the words of a Soviet critic, when she was a university student, I quote, all artists were divided into realists and formalists. Formalists were all bad guys, and there was no need to know them. Formalists, all those who did not fit into the academic canons. Favorsky was formalist. You saw his picture on the previous um, slide. Matvey, formalist, Lebedev, formalist, totally not on your life. Rodchenko, heavens no. The end of quotation. Uh, the next, please. In many respects, uh, the next one. Uh, yes. In many respects, the situation continued after the death of Stalin, as old Stalinist artists did not want to give up. You can see the example of the mature Soviet official style here. No surprise. Uh, their younger opponents tended to see themselves as leftist in opposition to socialist realism and artichet. The next one, please. Uh, and one more. Yes. Uh, you can compare with the new leftist style. 
They appeal to other traditions, alternative models, and the very experience of the right to choose are the degrees of the freedom now available to the artist at the long 60s. If they valued their freedom, they had three options. First, to leave union of artists and thus change a profession. Second, to stay and make socialist realism for exhibitions and experiments not for show. And finally, to try and develop this freedom from inside the union. To be precise, we are talking about official artists of the union. They had the courage or curiosity to probe the boundaries of what was permissible open exhibitions for the Soviet public, or closed exhibitions intended for their colleagues. The next, please. Mm. Any subjective expression was considered leftist, including even slight deviation, as here, uh, on this uh, picture, in the realm of legalized imagery. So it was not so much about that, as about politics. As criticism from the right, the power resource was used against them. The next, please. And the official Moscow exhibition, the Young Exhibition Committee showed some, uh, one more, please. Yes. Uh, showed uh, some old avant garde artists like. These two artists, yet recently banned names. Uh, the next, please. Or these artists who were banned at that time. Well, works far from the official realism style occupied the best places to the disadvantage of official art. The next, please. Um, here you can see shouting state leader on both pictures. Um, the Stalinist artists happened to force the state leader, Khrushchev, the Minister of Culture, and members of the top party central committee to come. And the next, please, the results were devastating for the young artists when all main newspapers published uh, terrible reviews, criticizing, reproaching, and accusing them in uh, anti-Soviet propaganda. Well, a little later, the artists suffered the effects of criticism from the left. The factor of the Iron Curtain affected the term Second Soviet Avant-Garde. Uh, the next, please. The key is, is that terminology is a social construct that determines both recognition and market value. Thus, the young artists of the Union were deprived of either. The underground radical artists, you can see um, two different artists from different teams or schools, um, could not pretend to the exhibition halls and commissions of the Union. They considered the Union used to be too timid in terms of innovation of their language. And they also considered they deserve more in terms of social capital. The fact of the real or imagined West important in the Cold War era played a role here. Omitting details, the radicals came to be quite well known in the Eastern Bloc and in the West by exhibitions, articles, and even books, uh, including Alternativa Attuale, Accordi di Crispolzi in 1965, for example, uh, the group movement, I mean, Leon Osberg and uh, some other artists. There, the historicizing of the underground movement took place, and the term second avant-garde has become coined 
in Western art critic precisely for the underground and only for them. In contrast, the young artists of the Union were not allowed to take part in unofficial exhibitions in the West. Consequently, they remained outside of the attention of collectors, critics, and the public. The silent majority, in this sense, are those who are, are unknown, who are not written about in the West behind the Iron Curtain. It is worth adding that after the mentioned Scandalous exhibition, the young artists of the Union were forced to work under the strict control, unlike the underground artists. In other words, they were held hostage to the situation, having lost the right to self-definition from the very beginning. So we have determined that official young artists with their interest in the left and avant-garde art do not exhibit themselves outside of official institutions and do not support the official art remaining unnoticed. In the second part of my presentation, I am discussing this as practices of the artifice the mode of thought invested in a mode of action. But how do these practices function in the social and aesthetic realm? Not only was the resistance silent, but also of that special kind that did not look like a resistance at all. And it turns us to wooden sculpture and modernization. Let's look at the group of Moscow sculptors, the most relevant example here. Uh, please, uh, it is one sculptor of this group, uh, the next one, uh, Nina Zhilinska, the next one is Alla Pologova, and the next one is Andrei Krasulin. There were others from and from Leningrad, from both capitals, but they used wood a bit another way. Please, uh, let's see uh, the slide with three different sculptors. You can see um, the wood painted in a traditional manner, in folk manner, the constructivist way of work with wood, and finally, wood in Malevich style, so to say. Wood, paradoxically, was entitled to some official recognition, including exhibitions and purchases for the museums, precisely because of modernization. It started from the Khrushchev development of the chemical industry. The government issued two resolutions on chemical industry in the late 50s and in the early 60s. Magazine decorative art in the USSA, that time it was quite liberal, innovative, advanced and new. Uh, published series of materials about plastics in art. During the 60s, the number of articles about plastic first is dramatically rising and then declining. The last articles were a review of an exhibition or on chemistry and an article about plastics just in a genre of reflection, just so. Then it published only articles and debates about glass, ceramic, stone, wood, so nothing to do with plastic. The response of the union is even more interesting. Uh, the next, please. It was a large-scale meeting of the Union and Art Fund, so the top of artistic bureaucracy, um, uh, that took place uh, discussing new materials and sculpture in 1960. Uh, look at the quotation uh, about development of our chemical industry, accordance with the seven-year state plan, uh, creation and manifestation of new materials, become progressive, connection of artists with engineers and technicians, all this. 
and invited speakers were chemical engineers from institutions and just chemical laboratories. Uh, presentations they made uh, about use of plastics and sculpture, like new alloys for sculpture, application of plastics and sculpture properties of, uh, excuse me, I have read it, of organa mineral concrete on the basis of polymer in sculpture. Uh, well, according to this quotation, it opened quite optimistically. But it was the engineers who stated that first, laboratory experiments are not confirmed, then pressure and thermal conditions, I quote, are variable and mysterious. And finally, sculptural plastics requires careful studies, scientific justification, impossible under our conditions. So, uh, please, the next one. We know um, some projects in plastics. One, I show you one early and one of that time. And actually, I wasn't able to find more. So we can consider them occasional projects. So we can consider that the official initiatives to use new modern chemical materials in sculpture, like plastics, failed. So the list of official materials for sculpture was extended to include the matter cheaper than bronze. What does it mean? We remember that all the professional materials and tools for the art were in the hands of the state and could be distributed only among official artists, like paints, canvases, paper, as well as plaster, bronze, marble, and so on. There is no wood in the list. It was considered the most personal matter for sculpture. First of all, because uh, the artists did not need official rooms or factories of the union to work on it. It could be done just in the atelier. The next place, unlike marble or bronze, which were given to artists by official permission, wood was impossible to control and easy to find. Uh, this is a funny example of two sculptors who work from the same pile of trunks. I know it by the words of one of these sculptures, and by his proper words, he just wanted to enter in the artistic polemic with the other one. The next, please. Uh, one more example. The sculptor explained to me that he used to use the old railway ties for his sculpture. You can imagine uh, why wood wasn't in the official list. Considering these uh, state campaigns, I mean to use material cheaper than bronze, it is no surprise that the art world and museum curators come to consider wood acceptable. Besides, the charm of the wood is that artists can work in direct cut technique himself. It becomes a form of subjectivity. The more unnoticed, the more it was legal. Naturally, thus, it is wood that is closely connected with social practices. However, the rising quantity of works in wood and timber can be understood as personal response to modernization in one more perspective. The next place. This time it is a pro-rural or anti-urbanistic everyday experience. I would call it Soviet Atlantides, the results of big industrial projects to build the networks of power supply. Back in the 30s, it covered Moscow and the Volga River. The old historical cities in the most populated areas were devastated and flooded. This on the left is such an old historical city before flooding. 
in the late 50s, uh, the turn of Siberia came. The Yenisei, the Angara rivers experienced flooding on the right picture. It was one of the richest cities in the area. Um, about hundreds of settlements were flooded and devastated, and hundreds of thousands of people were relocated from these lands. Uh, Bratsk, Irkutsk, Krasnoyarsk, and several other cities. The next, please. Especially relevant for artists of Moscow, it was, who shared their common concerns on the destruction of traditional village. You can see the moment of flooding and the result of the flooding. Artists, I, I stress the word common concern because artists, the next please, had workshops in the villages in the 60s, not only in the city. They choose places to live together with like-minded people. He is such village community, including uh, famous writers, artists, and uh, the view of this village itself in winter, in snow, with small church, still preserved at that time, and so on. Uh, artists who lived in such communities witnessed the devastation and results of the devastation. The next, please. This picture is done by one of the artists from the previous um, slide, and you can see how he stressed the apocalyptic eschatological character of what is happening, making the church bell to um, bend from the vertical even more, and the original view from the same point is on the photo. Well, shortly, they considered the village and provisional life fragile, but also able to resist to annihilation because of its mobility. Uh, the next, please. Look uh, at two examples. One is dismantling of the house, of the village house, in preparing for flooding. Another is the process of assembly of the village house, of uh, the church, actually. In the 60s, it was the reverse process. W uh, the creation of village reserves as open-air museum. The most relevant folk architecture of the region was relocated from different places of the area and concentrated into such museums. Especially it concerned so-called historical Russia, the Northwest. We can see the anti-modernist experience, the next place, at the levels of both techniques and imagery. Here, the artist actually builds his sculpture with eggs and carpentry techniques. The next, please. Um, you can see the constructive elements. These two pictures are uh, the fragments where the artist follows the traditional carpentry village technique of uh, making wooden object. And uh, we can see another one, the next, please. Mm. It is uh, the photo of Andrei Krasulin, a young artist, traveling along Yenisei, exactly in the year of flooding, 57. And with the project he made in the same, repeating the same traveling, the same way, 
50 years later. He calls it dreary landscape. Uh, indirectly, the video also includes architectural elements to say their absence. Uh, and now we can turn to the artifice as artistic practices. It is the last uh, part of my presentation. I quote, the union of uh, artists finally decided in the mid-60s. An understanding of form can only be developed in terms of the legacy. Uh, so the legacy, please, uh, the next one, was transmitted as bookish knowledge for everybody interested. Museum reserves for those who knew what to ask and where to ask. And teaching of still living artists and networks of their pupils and followers. As for bookish knowledge, it was especially decorative art magazine which published articles of Favorsky, Kharjev on Elisitsky, especially focused on constructivists and Rochenko. The next, please. Some young artists happened to get to the museum reserves. You can see here some objects of the Futuma school, which served as a base for the later reconstruction. And uh, one more object, the next please. Uh, Tartlin's famous last uh, installation, sculpture, object, uh, whatever, uh, called Le Tartlin, connecting two parts um, in one name. In English, we can translate it as flying Tatlin. Uh, Tatlin died in 1953, two months after Stalin. In conversation and, uh, with such artists or their pupils and still sharing of still living memories, artists could get a good school. Uh, the next, please. In the late 50s, the recent pupil of Tatlin tells artists of the Union about the key example of this first avant-garde that I have showed. He explained that Tatlin focused on an intrinsic quality of material, primarily wood. And um, example uh, and the title of uh, his speech in transcripts of the Union of Artists is Discussion of the role of the material on the creation of the sculpture. No name of Tatlin at all. You see, to organize the meeting, it was necessary to avoid names. It is tricks of artifice uh, to stay unnoticed that I've mentioned. The next, please. Uh, another powerful effect example of um, one more sculptor. It is a really titanic sculpture of wood or sculptures. I noticed here uh, the artist stayed by the official system in the direct sense, in the underground cellar, just in the same center of Moscow. He worked for future, yet it has never come for almost all of his um, works only 40 from 250 works um, were found finally in the late 90s. Yes. And uh, the next, please, um, the example 
of Vladimir Favorsky of the high aesthetic from revolutionary romanticism of Tartle Not Zaplin, rector of Hutema School in 23-26. He developed general theoretical ground for very important concepts of space construction and composition for the language of constructivist artists. So not based on left or industrial art, but on earlier theory of Adolf Hildebrand of the early 20th century. He was the father of the Moscow School of Woodcut. The next, please. And one of the main actors in the invisible resistance to the imposed uniformity. It was the kind of resistance that was based on skill and art and personal values that had nothing to do with the immediacy of the ordinary world. It was a practice of playing by his own standards within the field of power. Uh, as one critic said, I quote, and in fact, it was outside of the Soviet art and was directed just against the very basis of Soviet art itself, end of quotation. This centered the next place in the Red House, a workshop he built in a remote area of Moscow. Several other families settled there, children of repressed artists and priests, not so much intellectuals as artists in the pre-revolutionary sense of the world, I mean with the dignity and honesty, the next place. The networks of kinship and friendship were established there. The ties reconnecting the present and the past was a repository of their private, uncontrolled memory. In other words, he was, and still is, the constant presence of a living that is reproducing and changing tradition. I mean, there was no need to lie, even though the Soviet art and social life cultivated the life. Note that all members say that there was often laughter and joy. And two last examples from the circle of the Red House to conclude. Please, the next one. Um, besides of direct cut technique, Andrei Krasulin himself considers his art just as a play. A play means... Uh, we can call him Homo Ludens, uh, playing human, yes, deceiving imposed rules. Homo Ludens, uh, I can remind, is from the book of Heisinger, and I'd like to, to remind you the definition of the play. Play is a voluntary action of or occupation according to willingly accepted but absolutely obligatory rules with a purpose contained in itself accompanied by the feeling of other being than ordinary life. End of quotation. And the last example, um, the detachable figure is also a play demanded only three hours to cut it during just a table talk by words of his son, Ivan. Direct cutting is an action here in parallel to words to the talk. A critic says about performative characteristics of uh, this wooden sculpture. From Favorsky, he absorbed the concept of the divine essence of space and related concept on the material nature of work of art, which is both an image and an object that affects the environment. However, this should be taken critically. We have a witness of what he himself sought, an unpublished letter to Alek Kudryshov, his friend who immigrated to the UK. Ivan, who recently shared this letter with me, says that it was characteristic of that entire circle of like-minded people. Then, next, please. Um, I quote, if the Christian world has never existed outside, and it becomes so only in the measure of your personal effort, then you cannot be angry 
or resentful, neither at the outside world, nor at individual people, any more than you can be angry or resentful at rain or birds, but you can only do it. Do it yourself. Shortly, it explains that working with wood is an option to confront the challenging Soviet world based on appeal to tradition and a play. In conclusion, the performativity of wooden sculpture in this circle of artists tends to be connected not even with the pre-Stalinist, but with the pre-Soviet like life-building project and its ethical norms. One critic also from this generation would say, while already in exile, the writer and literary critic dissident Senyavsky once stated that he had only aesthetic disagreement with the Soviet authorities. I think that the aesthetic position is much broader and more serious than the political one, because it includes the notions of beautiful, moral and ethical values, the idea of good and evil, justice and the powerless, everything that a person of political orientation can easily disregard in order to achieve higher, from their point of view, goals. Thank you. What about questions? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Olga Rusinova, for this very um, very, very interesting talk and something very, very different from everything that we know, I believe, right? I don't know, it's my personal ignorance, but I had never heard of any of that. So it was very interesting to learn. Um, I think we could have a couple of questions because I think we'll have different, very different subjects between one topic and the other. So maybe it's better to, if you have questions to, to go into it that now I would like to make some comments to you and if you don't mind before I I pass it over to you again I would like just to make a short comment in Portuguese for the undergrad oh, students sure. vontade. <laughs> eu vou fazer uma, uma breve um breve comentário em português pedir a licença porque eu sei que uma parte da da sala é de alunos de graduação, então eu gostaria de frisar alguns pontos de maneira clara que eu achei importantes da fala da professora Olga e também com relação ao, para os alunos de graduação, com relação ao nosso curso, né? porque é, o conhecimento de cada um com relação ao contexto da arte na União Soviética certamente varia, os nossos alunos aqui de pós-graduação já passaram, pelo menos, por algumas disciplinas em que isso foi tratado, sobretudo se fizeram a minha disciplina, viram um pouco, é, sobretudo se fizeram quando o Tiago era PED, aí sabem mais ainda. Mas, é, de toda maneira, acho que com relação ao que a gente está discutindo agora no curso de, sobre a sociedade do espetáculo, a gente começou a falar sobre esse contexto da Guerra Fria e sobre as críticas que aparecem com relação à União Soviética na Guerra Fria, a gente vai ver isso melhor na fala do Jacopo, certamente, porque o operaísmo tem a ver com, diretamente com isso, mas também é muito interessante perceber aqui, portanto, se vocês entenderam é, o que a professora nos apresentou, como dentro, então, dentro da ideologia oficial da União Soviética, né, essas proposições artísticas da qual ela fala tentam instaurar uma fissura notadamente com relação àquilo que aparece como um, um culto da modernização. Né? Então, a gente falava sobre como a, a Revolução Russa, uma vez encaminhada é, é, como uma forma de reorganização da economia na antiga Rússia e nos países em torno que vão integrar a União Soviética, acaba se revelando uma forma de recuperar um, um déficit de modernização que a Rússia tinha com relação à Europa Central. 
Né? Então, a gente falava na aula passada sobre uma crítica que se desenvolve com relação à União Soviética, entendida, na verdade, como uma forma de modernização retardatária. Portanto, não como uma forma de organização política antagônica, aquela do capitalismo, mas, na verdade, como uma forma de organização que se revela mesmo necessária para a desigualdade do desenvolvimento do capitalismo na União Soviética. Né? Então, nesse contexto no qual há, portanto, esse, como a Olga falou no começo da fala, né, nesses anos, esses longos anos 60, que são marcados dos dois lados da cortina de ferro por um frenesi modernizante, né, que, cuja representação mais evidente, obviamente, é a corrida espacial, mas não só. Né, é, esses artistas dos quais ela está falando aqui tem uma é, manifestam né, uma forma de ruptura com essa ideologia, uma tentativa de resistência na escolha, inclusive, do próprio material que eles... É, seleciona. Né? Então, seria, ela está tentando mostrar aqui para a gente uma outra forma de resistência, menos evidente, né? portanto, não é uma resistência com uma formulação político-ideológica clara, né? mas é uma resistência na escolha de práticas que é, ficam de fora, né? ficam de fora e na contracorrente do que é a, a, a tendência oficial naquele momento, e insisto de novo nisso, né? a gente está vendo aqui algo muito específico da União Soviética, que, portanto, a gente conhece pouco, mas que, com relação especificamente a esse problema, também se conecta com o que se passa do nosso lado da cortina de ferro, né? porque é, é o mesmo frenesi modernizante. Então, é, é muito interessante né, perceber que essa uma, uma, um, um gesto singelo, alguns gestos singelos, né? isso que ela está chamando aqui do artifício, né? o artifício como é, prática política e como prática estética, que serve aqui como uma maneira de se distanciar é, sem uma outra maneira né, de se distanciar da astrologia sem necessariamente implicar na, na clandestinidade ou no exílio ou na, na entrada no âmbito de uma subcultura do underground e tal. Né? Então, ela está tentando mostrar uma, um outro espaço de retomada de práticas de vanguarda e de resistência política que não é aquele da confrontação direta e salientando essa escolha do material, acho que é muito interessante para a gente pensar outras relações e outros paralelos. É, I don't know if you understood everything I said, but it was pretty much my version of, of summarizing what you said, which I think it's important in relation to the course we are having now. I think it's very, very interesting, this fact that the, 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 the usage of this material, right, the, how you are stressing that the choice of one specific material in the, in the making of sculptures, so the choice for, for wooden sculptures, entails a lot of consequences, right? The fact that they, they are breaking with this very bureaucratic system of control by choosing a type of material that they can easily find. So this is a way of regaining, well, allow me the bond, regaining the means of production in that case, right? For them. And um, it's also, um, Uh, interesting for us to think that from a Western perspective and the relationship between you know, this, this rediscovery of constructivism, if we look, for example, into North American critique, they relate a lot the rediscovery of constructivism with minimalism. And minimalist sculpture was also... Uh, connected to the uses of industrial material and complex industrial finishing. So which is the opposite, right, of what they're doing, because they're revisiting constructivism to do something anti-industrial, right? And But um, at the same time, there was uh, Louis Neville's son, Henry Moore. Yes, you have some, or maybe we could think of Carl Andre too, right? Uh, yes. Andre uses wood. It is still a question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yes, and so, but it it, it yes. changes a lot. It's very different to see. Yes, it's for for future discussion. Yeah, but I just wanted to stress that. Yes, I'll... it's very. Thank you for this comment. It's absolutely in in uh, point to think further about this. Yeah. Yeah, I'll think further on that too. And something to think further also, which is probably more difficult for us to understand, is this, the last thing you mentioned, the fact that it's not only a matter of going 
to a pre-Stalinist reality, but trying to recover something from a pre-Soviet order, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I, I'm guessing this entails com a complexity to some contradictions, right? If this could be, is this entirely positive or this is some sort reactionary, is this related somehow to regaining because tradition and folk is always ambiguous, right? It's, it can be yes. very good and can be very dangerous too. Yes, it depends on people and on the artist because um, the line of uh, Favorsky was opposed with the line of populist folk artists. Uh, like Ilya Glazunov, who exhibited in the West, a lot and um, painted figures with large eyes, uh, something, something reminding uh, the Russian icon, all this. And uh, it was his line that won. Oh, okay. And led to nationalistic, patriotic, almost Nazi a uh, new Nazi uh, mentality. So that's the risk. That's the yes. risk I was thinking about. <laughs> yes, because, because uh, yes, it's interesting to see from the positive point and look at how it came in its development during 10 or 12 years to the negative point, to the absolutely opposite, uh, to the starting point. Okay. That's very interesting. Does anyone want to make a question? Or should we move on to the next guest? Alguém quer fazer uma pergunta para a professora Olga? A gente pode fazer depois também um debate com os dois, mas só se alguém tiver uma questão. Pode né? perguntar em português. Inclusive em português, né? Acho que. Se não, a gente segue. Então vamos seguir, né? Porque também acho que a gente já está aqui há quase uma hora. Eu vou passar a, a palavra para o próximo convidado. E a gente faz um debate depois uhum. com ambos, ok? Should I leave? Ok, eu vou sit aqui. Just want to look at the screen. Não é portátil, não? Eu não tenho. Será que. Não, eu quero falar. É, Cris, posso pedir para você? Esqueci de pegar água, você trouxe uma água. É uma água. Para mim também, por favor. Eu não preciso, eu tenho. Ah, é, é. Tá. É, é. Eu posso ir para o lugar, gente. Não, não, figura. Figura. Sim, sim. Okay, but we do this in English. Okay, so uh, let's move on with our discussion. We have now Professor Jacopo Galimberti from UAV uh, Venice, uh, the Institute of Architecture, right, mm. in Venice. And Jacopo um, has published several books. His last book is called Images of Class. Right, which is about uh, the operaismo movement in Italy, and well, and how art related to operaismo, and how operaismo related to art, also, or or better put, how operaismo used uh, visual elements to create a new image of class in this specific context of the 1960s. And I don't know how much people around here know about operaism, but it's a very important um, theoretical uh, reference for um, for reviewing the the revolutionary stance of uh, of the proletariat in this context of critique to the Soviet Union and destabilization context. So um, Jacopo will be here with us for two weeks, so he's going to give two talks. This is the first one. And I believe this first talk is related to your last book, right? So it will be a way of you to get to know uh, the content that he's presenting in his last research. 
and and I wish I know I think você que faz é ah, pode colocar Yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. see if that works. Thank you very much, Jacob, for Thank being you, here with, with us. for the invitation and, and create this great opportunity to discuss uh, the top this topic with your students. Um, okay, so this is uh, maybe I can just go. I mean, I can do it myself because I Whatever think it's want. easier to rather than ask you. So yeah, this is a very Uh, this provides this series of images provides an overview of the kind of material uh, I've been discussing in my book. Uh, so you have, thank you so much, architectural projects, photographs, graphic design, but also objects like the sofa for feminist meetings. There's a whole chapter about feminism, which is at the core of my next. A talk which is going to be next uh yeah next week um this is again some examples i mean my book is is a challenge because in a way i try to uh look at um, an understudied aspect of this political movement which has been mostly started by sociologists and political scientists. So one of the challenges was definitely to look at images as an entry point into something that has been discussed from a more theoretical perspective. Um, and also, I think that there was a kind of anti-hierarchical approach. So whereas people like Tony Negri or Silvia Federici have been translated into many languages and are definitely, you know, part, part and parcel of, of this story. Some of the artists and, and graphic designers and phot photographers that have been part of this movement have not been studied, have not been discussed by, you know, prominent publications. So I think the book was also a, a way to kind of, um, yeah, to kind of redress uh, to kind of tell a different story from a different perspective from maybe you know relatively well little known artists sometimes there are some exceptions though like balestrini for example um again some images but okay so i wanna you know uh, i've been looking at a movement at a, a or like a, a strand of thought that um involves almost three generations of uh, activists Uh, so it was very difficult for me to kind of uh, identify a topic. And I think also because, of course, I wanted to kind of find a topic that has to, something to say to the present time. So I decided to look at the image of the worker, how we uh, picture, how we imagine um, subjectivities, political subjects. And I think this is a problem that... Uh, In, in Italy as much as in Brazil has some sort of relevance. How can we imagine the working class today? Uh, of course, we need new images. We need, because the working class is no longer the working class from the 50s or 60s. But this is a problem that has been addressed also by, you know, prominent social movements like Operismo. So this is going to be the talk now. Um, but just... A few points to contextualize the social movements. Some of you may not be familiar with it, and I, I guess most of you actually. Um, so the institutional left, the communist and socialist parties, uh, were considered to be the main provider of ideology. So operismo is a form of leftist communism, of leftist, or it is a Marxist movement, of course, uh, that criticized Uh, the institutional left, which was considered to be, you know, part and parcel of the capitalist project in Italy. Italy was, of course, part of the American sphere of influence, so it was technically impossible to have a communist party in the government. I mean, the, gov the communist party was a, a completely legal party, but in reality, the the party could not win the elections because there would have been a coup. Uh, this is something that it was quite clear at the time, but it became in the 90s after the end of, of official end of the Cold War, 
it became quite i mean there's there's, there's been evidence that um you know the, the secret services were planning a coup in case the, the you know the communist party had won the democratic elections so called democratic elections uh, so this is just a very, you know, um, an overview to to tell you the, to kind of to situate politically operaismo. And then, what is operaismo? Rather, what is the difference between operaismo and autonomia? Operaismo is a a relatively niche Marxist movement that emerged in the early 60s in Italy, and that involves possibly a few hundred activists. In, in the country, what has autonomia, which is a more prominent movement also because, at least in Europe, it expanded to other countries, especially in Germany, the autonomen, and in France, les totaux, les autonomes. Autonomia was a broader movement. Some, uh, some uh, components of it were inspired or influenced by operism, but not all of them. So what, what are the core, I mean, of course, you know, these are, you know, complex, heterogeneous social movements, but what are the main ideas? The bottom line is really to oppose not only capital, but also the capitalist state and its institutions, including the trade unions. Autonomia, which means autonomo, autonomous, autonomous, means basically autonomous from the party, but also from the unions. Um, this is quite important also because this kind of idea that the working class is an, an autonomous political subject has f also philosophical consequences. But we can, uh, maybe some of them, some of these ideas will be uh, clear in a, in a few minutes by looking at the images. So the core idea of my paper is this. So what what does the working class look like? I mean, I guess we, we associate some images with the idea of working class today and in the 60s and 50s, but this is, the, the working class is of course an abstraction. Never You have never seen the working class. You've always seen, you know, examples of, it's like a, you don't have a direct reference. Um, so I think images have a performative effect. Whenever you depict a political subject, you contribute to shape it in a way. So maybe we can summarize one of the key problems of operismo and its artists in this way. I, I selected two quotes by Tronti, one of the main uh, figures of this Marxist movement. The working class is the enemy of everything, and even itself, qua capital. Working class is also enemy of itself because working class is also capital. The working class is a, it's not a, as the, the best part of humanity, that part of humanity that will save the world, but rather a rough pagan race without ideals, without faith, without morals. So a very negative subject, not a positive subject, not the angel, but the devil. So what does the working class look like? In other words, how is it possible to represent workers? If one posits for the working class a condition of known identification with itself. This is one of the quote, the, the first quote, the one by Tronti is one of the Deleuze's favorite quotes by Tronti is, he read Workers and Capital, and in one of his, in, in one of Deleuze's book, you will find a few sentences saying, this is, you know, very important um, comment about the working class that Tronti made. So the working class is an ending market. I, I, I will try to articulate this, this problem through four main points. And the last one is the most complicated one. So the first one, the working class is an enigmatic subject. This is a key idea of operaismo. So in order to, so the, I think this image is quite telling. Uh, on the right hand side, you have a, a magazine that um, appropriated a caricature by a Portuguese uh, artist, uh, Abel Manta, was a famous 
uh, artists, and the, the original subject was Portugal. After the revolution, Marxist thinkers seemed, un seemed unable to understand what was going on in Portugal. And so Samuel Paraisi actually replaced Portugal with a rather stereotypical work in this case. And so the, the you know, Marxist thinkers have to take note and they puzzle over this enigmatic subject. Autonomia, I forgot to mention that it evolves in the 70s. It's more like a 70s movement. But I, I, don't, wanna, I don't wanna dwell too much on these kind of theoretical differences because it might take a while. I might take us too far. Uh, so the working class is a dynamic subject that composes itself through dialogue, struggles, and persistently undergoes a process of recomposition. So Burismo, Try to devise a, a new, well, new, whatever. It's a, a, a conceptual distinction. So they don't talk in terms of class consciousness because they uh, assume that consciousness is something individual. So consciousness is something that has to be, you know, taken out of the recesses of the self. So they, they tend to talk in terms of class composition and recomposition. Uh, which under which uh, emphasized that class is a, is is a process. It's not an idea in in a people's mind. It's also a process that, of course, involves capitalism. Um, and there's there are also differences between the technical composition of the class or the the amount of technological. Um, well, I mean, I mean, as I said, maybe, maybe we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be too technical. But anyway, so they they try to basically put the class at the core of the process of uh, valorization of capital. So not capital, but the class. So even if they're more Marxist than Marx in a way, so you know, they, they want to. Marx talked in terms of technical composition of capital and political composition of capital. They talk in terms of technical composition of the class. So how the class relates to technology, how the class is also shaped by technology uh, and so on. So this is a good image, I think, of what they meant by class composition, because you don't, this is a very, you know, for, for, for the first page of a militant magazine, nothing happens. And this is the class that is composing itself, the subject, autonomously. You don't, you don't have a leader here. You don't have a, you don't have a trade unionist or a party cater. Uh, it's really about talking. It's really about you know, emerging as a subject. I think that the, the idea of the photographer that you can see from the kind of panoramic view, we are in Sardinia, by the way, and most of these workers used to be shepherds and this is what Operisi called the, the mass worker. So people who did not have a strong trade unionist uh, background, shepherds, uh, autonomous people who actually were looking for a, a permanent position in, in the factory. So they, they were non-dogmatic, if you want to put it like that. So the idea is to refer back to a very famous painting. You might have seen it. Uh, forget the other one for now. The, the third one is, this will take us too far, but the fourth estate, you have three leaders. Well, actually two. Two leaders in, on, on the front, they're better, you know, their, their clothes are better. They're more kind of the bourgeois, the, the workers' aristocracy, perhaps, and the masses behind them. They're also working, they advance it towards the light, uh, the future. You see that the night is in the background. And the woman, I, I really like this figure because the woman is actually a, what a, a negative figure here. She's trying to stop the two leaders. Reminds sort of emotional blackmail here. You know, you don't forget that you have a baby, that you have a family. But anyway, so there are also there are also women, of course, in the in the mass of workers. But this is just to make a comparison between two completely different ideas of the working class. In in the case, it's not even mentioned as such. It's the the fourth estate, the the more kind of closer to the French Revolution. Although the the painting was actually made at the end of, as you can see, of the century. Um, 
Another core idea that you have in operaismo is the working class is not, and like in English, because of course in English you talk in terms of working class, is not necessarily fan, a big fan of work. Uh, in fact, actually, in this case, I guess, okay, so this is a character that appeared in the, the first operaista magazine, Class Operaia, Working Class. And it's very rare to see workers who refuse works in the history of the workers' movement. I'll give you some example. One, one is up there. But in most cases, you have a very uh, negative depiction of lazy people. Of course, the, work is, the working class is defined by work. Well, in the case of Verismo, it's actually the opposite. Um, in fact, they even say, you know, a strike is not necessarily a way to negotiate something, but just a way for the working class not to become capital. Right? Um, so, it, 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 sometimes the, the words can help you understand why in, in, in Italian you would you talk in terms of, I, I think, like in Portuguese, operaio, which, does, which doesn't have the word lavoro in, 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 in the term. It's actually, the, the word actually comes from Latin and it comes from locatio operaris, which means that you employ someone for an extended period of time. So you're not actually referring to a work, but rather to the employment of a person. So it's actually an interesting word from an etymological perspective because it suggests a relation of power, not, or not a kind of the, 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 a job in itself. Okay, so the, four, the fourth point is possibly the most complicated, which is really the core of my talk, is the working class as a monster. And so some of the texts published by the first Operista magazine have been translated into many languages, but nobody really had, um, had paid attention to the images that appear in this magazine, which was roughly a monthly, published between 63 and 5. And there are about 20, 20 images, 20 drawings. Uh, made by an artist. Um, I want to focus on some of them. The first one is this one. And it's very interesting because the images tell you less and more than the articles. And so the artist was also a militant who actually attended the, the meetings, as you can see. He, see. you know, he listened to his comrades and made some drawings. Some of, some of them have been published. I also went to the archives of these, of these artists and I discovered some things. I will show you that in a minute. So, good night, Mr. Boss, says uh, the, the caption. And when I first looked at this image, I thought, well, what is it actually? <laughs> It was pretty clear to me that this is about a worker coming out, coming or rather storming the scene and coming out of the night. Again, interesting, because if you think of also the Soviet tradition, workers come out of the light or advance like in the fourth estate towards the future, towards the light as something positive, of course. The working class as that part of humanity that will save the world. This is a different kind of working class. It's a negative subject. And in the, in the archives, I realized that actually the drawing had a title, which disappeared in the final version, which, which is Incubo, Nightmare. And there's a reference to Fusli, uh, where you know, the, draw, the, the dream has the same materiality as the dreamer, which is a goblin in this case, uh, the monster. And, and so I realized that actually we are witnessing the dream of the boss. The worker is the nightmare of the boss. And then by looking at these uh, sketches, I realized that there was a clear reference to Garnica, which was not very apparent in the final version of the drawing. Garnica was the most common uh, image of anti-fascism in, in post-war Italy. 
uh, a detail is also quite revelatory. The, the boss is possibly a member of the neo-fascist party, MSI. There's a, the symbol of the MSI, which is the party where Maloney uh, had a kind of uh, uh, political training the, the, the current prime minister, Mr. Meloni, um, has this flame as a symbol, which you can find in the bed of the boss. But who is this worker who storms in the night? He's a nightmare. He's uh, an anti-fascist. But how about his hair, for example? Or And this is, again, something I, I kind of realize by looking at the sketches. So the, the, the worker is actually the condensation of very many figures. Is He's, a, you know, partly the cat of the industrial workers of the world. But in the metamorphosis of this dream, I mean, the, the condensation is really a Freudian term. When you, in, in the dreams, you, you condensate different figures and you see, you know, and this is part of the grammar of dreams. The worker is also a skeleton, the top image on the right hand side. The worker is also a weird figure because I didn't quite understand what he was wearing. It was like, a, seemed like a, um, the helm of a knight, but also the helmet of a, of a wielder. Uh, we're talking about a factory worker, of course. And I think it's both of them. It's quite interesting because uh, in other caricatures of uh, class of pariah, the, the, there are knights, uh, but they are the bosses. In Italy, as Berlusconi, you might, you might know that, he was also called Cavaliere, because it was Cavaliere del Lavoro, so labor's knight. Uh, it's a title that you, you can uh, receive from, from the government if, you know, for, well if you do something positive for, for labor. Um, so I think the worker, or actually the nightmare of the boss is a sort of, is a worker who actually took the helm of a knight almost as a scalp, as an Indian, like a Native American of, of course, Western films, who is, um, sculpt the boss and, you know, sports the, the helm uh, as a trophy. Uh, I think there's also perhaps a, a critique that you can um, elaborate about this image because I think precisely of the supposedly feminine connotation of this long hair, uh, Mariotti added the spurs in the final version. You can see the spurs, as if he wanted to say, yeah, this is a bit of a cowboy, actually. Not, not a feminine figure, because I think, in a way, but this is maybe, I don't know, this is my interpretation. What you can see here, you know, you have a, 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 a black cast, you have a figure flying in the night, you have a bit of a witch, that is also part of this iconography. And the feminine, you know, the long hair might suggest a witch. Um, another image, and we get closer to the figure of the monster here. This is again, this is a, a leaflet that uh, advertised the second version of the magazine, so Class of Prior, the second series, not second version. And the title reads The Dragon and St. George. So it kind of reverts the Christian iconography. And so I thought, well, this is, you know, two workers. Again, you, you also have a sort of cat in, in the shape of the bulldozer. Uh, but so where is the dragon, actually? Um, and then I realized that, well, the dragon is the bulldozer. The dragon is the worker, the two workers. Uh, whose face actually echoes the blades of, of the bulldozer and again the cat, the, the jumping cat. And the knight. So who is the knight? I, I thought it was this kind of symbol of capital of the Christian Democrats because he has this kind of shield 
uh, which is, was also the symbol of the Christian Democrats. But in fact, the night is not, is really old socialism, old socialism. Um, a kind of uh, fit, kind of image of the work, the workers' movement that sanctified themselves. You know, the good against the evil. Saint George as a symbol of, uh, you know, the kind of angelic vision of the workers' movement against the dragon of capital. Here, the situation is reversed. Is reversed. So the dragon, the monster, is the worker movement. Is a negative force, enemy even of itself. No positivity, no saints, no holy figures. So, but Prism is actually chasing whole socialism away here, which has a very pre Raphaelite iconography, as you can see, very academic, whereas the two workers are quite, you know, uh, geometric. And so, where is the princess? The princess is in the picture, the princess has lost its her trappings, the, the princess is technology. So not the noble knight, not the, uh, the horse, but rather technology as something that the working class has to appropriate. Um, I think Mariotti was from Florence. I think there's also very clear reference to a very specific iconography, that of Paolo Cello, uh, which is also quite ironic in a way. But anyway, let's move on. Another image made by Mariotti a couple of years later for Potero Prior, in many ways an attempt to continue what Class Prior had begun, but in, within the context of massive strikes, those of 1969. Um, this is a different type of worker. It's not funny anymore. Although, of course, I mean, there's, there's a quite interesting, there's an element of irony in it because the point again, what well, actually connects these two types of workers, one is, as you can see, uh, witty and, 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 and small. This one is more muscular, much bigger. But what connects these two figures is the fact that they both come from the night. Both negative figures. This is a sort of devil with bloodshot eyes, with, you know, his eyebrows are almost like flames. I don't know if I can magnify a bit. I don't know, no, not really. No, well, anyway, maybe you can see what I can point to the eyebrows. It looks like a devil, and, and I could see that, but a, a former work actually told me, yeah, there used to be a, actually uh, an image at the time, and so there was, I was not, you know, aware of that. There was a, a, a poster to advertise pills against headaches, which was called Fiat, for whatever reason, but it was not related to the automobile factory. Um, so, in fact, the reference to a devil was quite clear at the time. And this is a sort of Lucifer, the light bearer. It's, Mariotti is basically saying, so, because Fiat, uh, you know, the, the name of the automobile factory, is actually it's like it's like a 19th century factory so it has a, a reference to the genesis the book of genesis where um, uh, god um, um, uh, speaks uh, how can i say like um, uh, yeah creates light or says let there be light that's the beginning of genesis so fiat the automobile factory actually wanted to to nobilitate, uh, you know, the act of producing industrially. It's almost as if, you know, they had a kind of godlike power. In this case, it's it's a sort of detournement. It's like a, a, an attempt to say, well, the workers decide uh, that there'll be lights. And this is the, you know, the eternal fire of hell. It's not heaven. Um, and the image of the worker as a, as a monster is also something that... Do I have... How much time do I have left? Ten minutes, maybe? Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. That um, is like almost a constant of this movement. And I think this is extremely interesting because sometimes images... Um, you know, 
tell you something different about a social movement. Think of, you know, symbols like the gilet jaune, the, the what's the word in, uh, the yellow vest in, in France, it was a social movement a few, few years ago. But every social movement uh, develop its own symbols and, and they speak a different language. You, you know, images have their own semantics. And I think, so the, there's, you will find basically nothing about the figure of the monster within Operismo. You can find something much later. 20 years later, they think about the monster, but not in the 70s. But their magazines and posters are full of monsters. Also, as I try to, to highlight, uh, sometimes it's not, it's not very explicit, but the images become slightly more explicit in the 70s. Well, in this case, you have, a, in English, it's called uh, the game of the goose. Uh, do you have something like that in, in Brazil? Like, a, you need, yeah? But I, I think you get the logic, so you need to get to the end through dice. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, sometimes you have a goose in Italy, but it doesn't matter. I mean, in this case, the goose has been replaced by a dragon. Uh, and you can choose one of the five characters that uh, they symbolize the four uh, key components of autonomy in the 70s. Cala of course, it's it's a kind of ironic depiction of it. Uh, the Calam Calamity Jane is the feminist. Uh, Cochise is um, the metropolitan Indian or the proletarian youth. Uh, also was quite fond of uh, Native Americans, but again, not the real one, but rather the kind of very stereotypical Native, Amer Native Americans of Western films. Uh, then Ratata Le Fou, which is uh, a kind of crazy bomber with, that represents the armed components of the movement, like Prima Linea. Uh, then you have uh, Gasparazzo, which was another um, um, fictional worker. And, uh, and you, it's very small. You have uh, Diabolic. I, I don't know if you... It's, which is a popular uh, thief. Uh, and the thief symbolized the um, proletarian expropriation. People just, you know, stole supermarket and just got everything they could. Um, and so this, it's quite interesting because it's called the Chinese dragon. It's also a very heterogeneous figure because the Chinese dragon, as you can see, has um, the pawns of a chicken, the, the, the mouth of a dog, uh, has the body of a snake. So I think maybe subconsciously this image of monster, of dragon, uh, managed to capture the plurality of a movement. There was a movement of movement, which included feminism, which included a sort of queer uh, component, which includes the factory workers uh, and many other sub-movements. And for reasons that partly, you know, are very difficult to trace, the image of the dragon became one of the leitmotiv of autonomia uh, in the 70s. Um, here you have uh, some examples of dragon. Sometimes they were performed. Uh, during Carnival, it was a way to have a demonstration without declaring it. For example, in this case, on the left-hand side, you had some murals, but also on this, in the zines, some artists made these tiny little monsters. And in, during 77, so the figure of the monster became a quite interesting one because it was also a way to signify a total break with the history of the workers' movement. A monster, monsters are not part of, you know, the kind of um, history, the history of political thought. I mean, they're generally, I mean, actually, they are part of sort of political theratology. Think of Leviathan in Hobbes. But uh, I think what actually made the monster a very interesting figure was that the monster... Monsters are quite unique creatures. They don't have a gender. 
we don't quite know if they can reproduce. We don't know. They don't have, you know, fathers, mothers. They're unique figures. And I think this is what really uh, made this symbol an interesting one. Sometimes monsters are, as in the case of the Chinese dragon, a mixture of different uh, real animals. Um, as in this case, you know, the image at the center. Um, and I think autonomy of movement like to see itself as, as a sort of unique movement, a mixture of different things, but also a movement that did not have, um, you know, a legacy or could not or did not have a past of course he had a past but that so i mean it was a movement that saw itself as a total break with the you know the political um theratology of the 19th of the 20th century sometimes monsters uh speak a language that nobody can understand this is rough sort of fake hieroglyphs um Sometimes the you know the, the readers could send letters to Lotta Continua, and the monsters were kind of symbolized this, this you know subjects this wrote letters to a journal to, to a magazine, and, and these letters were extremely uh, difficult to understand. Sometimes it was a way to kind of give voice to a movement without filters, right? Uh, and it was one of the most controversial uh, pages of this magazine, the letters of the reader, the reader's letters. Sometimes it's the, these monsters reference the Wunderkammer, uh, these spaces that, you know, were very sort of prehistory of museums in the 16th century and beginning of the 17th century, where you have a mixture of artifacts and odd natural things like animals, but also corals, also liminal materials that were difficult to categorize. And this is what made these places also very interesting from a scientific, scientific perspective. But later, they, they became you know, a cabinet of curiosities. But in fact, it was, I mean, in the beginning, they were, they were also a way to kind of, the thing, the plurality of the universe, um, This is uh, yeah, another example of the references are sometimes very, very clear. And so you might wonder if feminists also kind of uh, appropriated this uh, iconography, and the answer is yes. They, in 78, they kind of relied on these figures to produce a sort of bruca, uh, which is a witch in Spanish, but also a caterpillar in in Italian in the Italian language. So they used again. So they echoed. They wanted to kind of have their own monster, if you want to put it like that, uh, which had a feminist connotation. This is something I realized later. It's not in the book. Um, monsters, and the word monster comes from monstrum, which is which means. Um, Hang on a second. Um, in English, it would be like um, the revelation of changes. So monster, monster were often uh, um, seen as uh, uh, predicting something. So when a monster was born, uh, some um, people were inquired about the meaning of this. Uh, of this uh, birth. And it's also interesting to see how in the 80s, uh, what has the autonomia movement continued producing monsters, uh, the visual culture of the time is also full of monsters. Monsters as a sort of um, creatures that appear in a time of change. And I think the 80s are a time of change. You, you have, well, these are some examples of, oh, sorry, some more, you know, popular monster, Alien. Uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show is also a show of monsters in many ways. Elephant Man, Blade Runner. Uh, in the 80s, you have the first articles coming from the tradition of a and autonomia that really discuss monsters. 
and try to think monsters politically. Uh, but, this, but the images came first. Um, and so here you have other monsters. Frankenstein, of course, is a very prominent figure for the worker. The very last image, uh, yeah, the monster begins to speak again. Uh, a monster as a figure of multiplicity, of a heterogeneous movement. Um, even so, you might, and, and this is to conclude, you might wonder, so how about Marilyn? And, and I asked a, one of the people who actually made this magazine, and he said, well, Marilyn is a vamp, is a vampire. But Marilyn is also the image of a sort of unattainable beauty. The, the the state this is a this is a photo montage and uh, the the man is a judge and seven of Ripley is the date where um, a wave of arrests again against, against autonomia began so this is actually a very tragic moment and they, they decided to to use this image which is not of of course an image of of suffering but rather an image that celebrates something a sort of uh, the beauty of a social movement that is being uh, oppressed and largely uh, prosecuted. Um, so, yeah, that was it. Thank you, Jacopo. Grazie tanto. It's very amazing talk, which is partially related to the first chapter of your last book, right? But yes. not everything. There, there's some stuff here that I haven't yes. seen yet. So, um, very, um, a very good ex example of something that I wanted to highlight to students of how you manage to cross material coming from social history to art history and the study of visual culture. And as Jacopo said himself, and I would like to stress on that, we are talking about publications that have been long commented on with perspectives um, restricted to sociology or, uh, or political thought. And um, Jacopo's works, the first one where I've seen this duly dealt in the terms of visual culture and art history. And okay, there's a lot of things here that I'd like to react to because this is uh, close to some of my own topics of research, but I don't want to be the only one speaking here. So I would give you first the chance of making questions if you would like. Um, ao menos que eu tenha que quebrar esse... Não, é, alguém gostaria de colocar uma questão antes que eu comece a falar longamente, monopolize completamente a fala, como eu fiz na, no comentário anterior? Ótimo. <risos> Com certeza. A gente ouve, mas o problema é que é, tem a transmissão, então acho que precisa de um microfone para gravar, é isso? Você é, se importa? Eu levo aí para você. Se eu não passar vergonha e sofrer um acidente desse ano. Muito obrigada. É, bom dia, boa tarde, né? É, eu gostei muito da apresentação do professor. É, e aí, enquanto o professor estava falando, é, ele comentou sobre, a, principalmente quando ele estava falando do operarismo, né? sobre essa relação do trabalhador com a figura do, do diabo, do demônio, e várias coisas relacionadas. E aí ele mencionou também no começo que o operarismo é, é marxista, né? E aí eu queria saber se existia também uma elaboração em paralelo com essas imagens, uma elaboração teórica desses trabalhadores em relação à igreja e ao capital, e se isso... É, mudava de alguma forma o movimento e se tinha tem a ver com essas imagens. Então, se é, a escolha da representação do trabalhador, não como um monstro qualquer, mas especificamente como 
é, figuras relacionadas ao diabo, então o gato, o íncubus, o, 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 a figura diabólica em si, se isso tem a ver com o anticlericalismo ou se é só essa questão mais é, figurativa do monstro como opositor e como tudo o que o professor trouxe. Obrigada. I think yes, it might have something to do with uh, the Catholic tradition. Ah, oh, yes, sorry. I think so. Yeah, I think uh, in a way, yes. Uh, there's clearly, you know, a very Catholic iconography. Also, the devil as the ultimate form of, you know the evil and the negative, the something that cannot be reconciled with the, you know, the state of things. On the other hand, though, I think it's always very important to, re to remind that even Marx, uh, and it, there's a book about uh, Marx possibly trying to construct capital, his book, Capital, Uh, following Dante's Inferno. Uh, it's a literary scholar who tried to show that it was using some images and rhetorical devices to construct a book that reflected the structure of Dante's Inferno. It's not really important for me if this is true, but what I actually mean is that in order to construct a credible narrative or iconography, you need to refer back to what people are familiar with. So the reference to the church does not necessarily imply some sort of subconscious Catholicism. No, le mm. um, I don't I don't think so. I mean, um, the church was as is always the case in, in, in Italy, the church was both right wing and left wing. There were right wing components and there were also left wing components. And uh, operismo was not, this is something, this is something very interesting. I found very little about the church. I think because the topic could have proven divisive. There was, this is my guess. So, so maybe some workers were atheists, some were Catholic, but the topic could have divided them. So it was not an easy topic. Um, so I don't think, uh, no, I don't think there's a, there's a very strong anti-Catholicism. The feminists were definitely anti-Catholic because of the role of the church, you know, in the uh, legislation against abortion and so on and so forth. But the workers' movement was less so. Just a quick remark on all this iconography of the monsters is also also sort of like an anti-classical coming back, right? So because it reminds a lot also the, the iconography of the Baroque and this period and how neoclassicism has kind of suppress this afterwards, like if we think about Mascheroni, this kind of things, right? So um, it's something that we see coming back in part of the Roman romanticism and then in some movements like surrealism. So normally movements that were a little bit in the countercurrent of modernity, yeah. they, they tend to push this back. And which is interesting in that case that you're showing that it really seems like a, a surfacing that comes um, in a kind of in a popular sector, let's say, like it's not, they're not refer some, some of the things really look like surrealist uh, drawings, but I don't think they are referring directly to that, right? It's more. Yeah, I think, I think the monster is really the figure of the negative. And they try to, as I said, they try to oppose an institutional left. They try to present themselves 
as the ultimate example of virtue, of uh, truth and good, and, and the good, really. Uh, the saint is the opposite of the monster. The saint kills the monster. So they wanted to kill the saint. Um, and they identify with this figure that eventually, I mean, this is, I, I was thinking of your research about uh, situations. You have quite a few monsters in some situations magazine, especially in the American, uh, I mean, Ben Maria and also the uh, King Mob, the, yeah. the British section of the yeah. situations. Uh, they, they like Phantomas. Yeah, they also it's on the cover. Yeah. And Phantomas is, is not a monster, but is a man without a face. And this is something we tend to associate with masks, with a monstrous identity, or, you know, a not humanist identity. Yeah. And I think today, I mean, if you look at social movements today, masks are everywhere. I mean, the, the, the pink balaclavas or the black balaclavas, but also the key folks, marks of V for Vendetta, they're all, you know, all ways to kind of uh, to challenge a human, the humanist connotation of social movement. Yeah, that's interesting. Good afternoon, and uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, the question I have is, I don't know, very basic, I guess, because my background on this specific topic is very reduced. And I don't even know if that's an aspect you'd like to elaborate on, but there, there was a moment in your talk in which you talked about, I cannot recall if it was in operaismo or if it was in autonomia, that the strikes for them were not necessarily a way to negotiate, but mostly a way to um, find, I don't know, to try not to uh, get the worker assimilated into an S capital itself. But I'm not sure I understood why specifically that would be, would it be in the sense of the semantics in which you explained as like to not conform being a worker with the work itself or in what way? I know it's very specific and not related to the iconography at all. I'm sorry, but I didn't understand it. Yeah, no, I, yeah absolutely. Like, it, it, it wasn't clear when I said that. Um, so a social movement like, or, or let's say a, a Marxist, current like operismo also try to reframe some of the you know most common topics of the workers movement like what is a strike and if you think or if you argue that the the working class should be an autonomous subject concerned not with progress with the capital p or with defending industry but with its own interests now you have a problem. So if strike is one of the most common and rightly so expressions of the workers' movement, well, what is a strike? A strike is also always a way to kind of have a dialogue with your counterpart. I mean, this is the way in which the workers' movement has always framed a strike, a way to negotiate, to put pressure on, man on management. Well, they said, yeah, of course it is, but you could also see strikes as a way to not to become capital, as a way for the working class to refuse to become capital, to stop working, not as a kind of step towards better pace, but a moment of respite, a moment of break, uh, where you are perhaps yourself. Uh, and this is something that makes, I think, operismo quite interesting because it is historically connected to the factory workers, but today strikes have become something different. Uh, they not necessarily concern the workplace sometimes, even student strikes. So I think this way to frame a strike is interesting because it tells you something about your subjectivity. Okay, thank you. Posso fazer? <risos> Aproveitar que eu já peguei o microfone. 
So thank you so much. Um, I have uh, I have two questions. Um, my point is the methodology. Uh, Professor Galimberti, I had the opportunity to read the introduction to your book, and it was amazing. <laughs> and uh, you mentioned the influence of Warburg's uh, methodology, and I would like to it's not a question, no, but I, I would like to hear you talk more about it, the influence of Weiberg's methodology, and for Professor Rosinova, is it correct? Can I speak in Portuguese? Do you prefer in English? Do you prefer in English? For now, but continue in English. Okay, okay. I will try. <laughs> um, this, the topic is very interesting for me because my research is about uh, some artists in the 1970s who were involved with some kind of materials like uh, organic materials and precarious materials in the in an ecological perspective. And I would like to to understand or to know if you if you have any methodological perspective in your research and which is I don't know that's it. <laughs> well about um, ecology yes it's first of all thank you for this good question and um, the ecological topic logically continues um, this um, point about flooding. Of course, flooding, wood ecology, and it was really the time when the early ecology appeared in Soviet Union. And um, already in the mid-60s, uh, or close to the late 60s, uh, first time it was pronounced officially in one meeting, just as we are uh, losing our forests, our um, village rural life, save the ecology. And uh, it was like, strange feeling that uh, the speaker pronounced it for the first time, though he, he could um, know this word, of course. Yeah, but uh, in the sense of the use of materials, uh, do you uh, have any methodology? Use of materials also, and um, in terms of use of materials, in terms of material response. Uh, to these new concerns. So they did not, I think, they did not divide between the landscape and the material. So it is a book recently published two or three months ago, um, The Green Forest Energy by Yelena Kachetkova in English. Uh, she is from the Sweden University, from uh, Swedish University. So uh, she she is a historian of ecology also and Soviet ecology as well. Um, okay, so I think there are two questions here because Warburg has been often used in the German-speaking context as an excuse to move away from Marxism, uh, which was a big thing in, in Germany in the 70s and, and earlier, and also a way to kind of move beyond what I try to do, which is social history of art. And the Warburgian methodology is has often been seen as a way to kind of... Uh, move beyond the social, the, the social constraints that uh, are implied in the construction of images. So you connect images from different contexts, from different times, and it's always very fascinating 
but this is for me very problematic. So what I try to do is actually to use Warburg against the Warburgian tradition as it exists today. So to politicize this kind of approach. So this is what well, you barely saw here, but uh, for example, sure, the old, the, the pagan gods are also part of this iconography. Uh, the worker that sits and has this kind of boss at its mercy when I was talking about the refusal of work is a sort of atlas that has the word, you know. So this is true. I mean, Vabog is useful as long as you understand how the classic imagery has informed the workers' movement and why. And I think this is interesting. If, if you, if you, I try to, I mean, it's not a big thing in my book, but I, whenever I try to use Warburg, it's in this way. It's against the Warburgian tradition. And I am about to publish a short text where it's about autonomy. They, they invented this text. It was the, the gist of the, the, the pistol, the gun. And you, you can also use Warburg to, because it's, it's never like that. At the demonstration, it was always like that. It's always like a kind of um, the benediction in a way. So you, you can use it as, you can use Warburg to understand these gestures. But I think it's always important to bear in mind, you know, the political rationale of these gestures. So this is why I think Warburg is important, but I need, it needs to kind of be detourné. Okay, so I'll try to, to speak in English, but my English is, is pretty awful. So, um, first of all, I want to thank you uh, for the communications. I found it very inter interesting that and in both communications, what is in... Um, they uh, both approach, uh, it seems to me, like uh, some kind of anti-Stalinist discourse uh, in one way or another, like in the sense that uh, the um, uh, wooden sculptures um, are in uh, a way um, like um, recovering some gist of the painters in the 30s, uh, like uh, Alexander Tischler, Alexander Drevin, that also um, um, recognized themselves as um, Mujiks or um, peasants, poor peasants, I think. And um, in uh, the paintings that they, uh, that they were made in, in the 30s, they could in some form elaborate the uh, brutality of the collectivization of the lands, the so-called collectivization. Um, some group of those artists like Alexander Drevin in Kazakhstan uh, and I was like imagining if those uh, artists that Professor Olga talked about um, are in some way mentioning those form of arts uh, and those artists that were um, repressed in the 30s I found it very interesting that in the, the magazine, uh, those photo magazines that show Khrushchev, uh, he mentions uh, uh, Drevin. And I don't know, I was just imagining if, if you can think about some, some kind of recovery of that debate that took place in the 30s. Don't know if, I, if my awful English could. <laughs> If I was understood. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it made sense. Yeah. In, in a way, both talks were a form of, yeah, discuss anti Stalinist art. You, you, yeah, you can see it like that, I think. I don't know. Do you want to react to that? No. Uh, well, thank you. And I was very glad to hear the name of Tischler. And yes, um, 
his colleagues. And I'd say that um, my choice of the topic, my anti stalinist concern, is connected with, um, so to say, um, waving, oscillating of the process in arts uh, connected with uh, changing ideology, changing political context, and so on, uh, from the left uh, to say to right and back. So uh, what we can see now for uh, last about 10 years in Russia, we have the direction to right, obviously. That's why um, it was interested, interesting to, to look at these hostages of previous or two previous or three previous generations even. I, I think maybe maybe saying that anti-Stalinist is, is correct, but maybe it's not that accurate. I, I would put it in a different way. I would say, yeah, well, in the case of a prism, I would really, I would rather talk in terms of anti-popular uh, front, aesthetic uh, politics. Uh, because a prisma is really, and, and this is possibly one of the most um, outdated dimension. I mean, the, the original form, this 1960s one, the 70s is a completely different story. It's really uh, the idea that the working class does not need the petit bourgeoisie, the middle classes, is autonomous. Um, so the popular from politics, which is partly Stalin, I mean, it's also what Stalinists wanted in the 30s, but now it's it's not the whole history of Stalinism, of course, uh, is much more humanist, also because try to uh, to appeal to, you know, any kind of uh, the, the fellow travelers, so kind of middle-class intelligentsia that was anti-fascist. So I think it's anti-Stalinist in the in the way in which Stalinism was also uh, internationally uh, embodied by the Popular Front politics. If I don't know, did these exist in Brazil, like some Popular Front in the thirties? Yeah, we have. It will take a while to explain Brazilian yeah. context, but. Yes, we had a lot of, um, let's say, in the, f in the 40s, maybe, uh, the idea of putting together like, um, the bourgeoisie and the workers, so also Communist Party would accept that this would be an, a strategic alliance between all the sectors. And then, of course, in the 60s, we have a military dictatorship, so it's a different story, right? But I think they can understand what this means, right? Uh, a ideia de uma frente popular. Bom, a gente acabou de viver né, tentativas de frentismo, mais ou menos o que a gente passou agora. Então, a ideia de que constituir uma frente ampla de setores progressistas da sociedade né, seria a melhor maneira de se combater alguma coisa. É, em momentos de desespero, a gente cai nessa história de novo. E, então, ele está sublinhando que para essa geração, para esse movimento da década de 60, a ideia da autonomia da classe operária é muito importante, portanto, ela não passaria nem mesmo pela, é, é, pela, pela tutela do Partido Comunista. Né? I think there's also something that is important to stress in what you show that it's important to stress to my students, especially in the course and in the undergrad course. This is very typical of the 60s, the idea that you need to avoid administration. Right? Like, Everything is controlled either by the state or by the party. So you stress this out already in your talk. Então, essa ideia que eu comentava na aula passada para quem é da graduação, né, de que é uma percepção muito da década de 60, de que é, há, de um lado, uma dominação burocrática, no lado da, da, da União Soviética, mas no lado do, 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 da, da, das, das sociedades ocidentais capitalistas, também há uma espécie de dominação burocrática, porque é um capitalismo administrado, porque é uma época de presença marcante do Estado enquanto administrador dos conflitos sociais. E essa, esses movimentos que emergem na final da década de 60, 
eles têm como proposta justamente escapar dessa dimensão da administração. Né? Então, eles colocam, às vezes, inclusive contra não só a frentismo, mas inclusive as, ao que seriam as instituições representativas da própria classe operária. Então, a discussão do operarismo está muito ligado a isso, a reformular a ideia de classe fora das suas instâncias de representação tradicionais. Por isso que olhar, como o Jacopo fez, para construção visual desse movimento é muito importante, porque eles estão justamente tentando romper com uma forma de representação política, o que significa também ter que romper com uma forma de representação em sentido mais amplo, portanto também de representação visual. Justo? Você está acordo? Né? <risos> Paula, por favor. Um, I would love to hear a little bit more um, about the question of floating because um, that really reminds me of a film by Davchenko, Poem of the Sea. Um, um, and also, uh, we talked a little bit about the relationship of those artists with the art that came before. And I would, and you even mentioned um, tattling, so I would like to hear a little bit more about that as well. Well, um, the relationships with um, the older artists um, depended on the group young uh, artists belong to. For instance, um, I know many, many witnesses, many memories about, well, we wanted to go to Tartlin or to Falk to show our works, but we were too shy and we had no uh, friends who could introduce us. And we didn't want to go just so, for instance. Um, So, uh, another, another point is that there were three F, so-called, in Moscow, Falk, Faworski, mm, and Van Wiesen. The last one, he was uh, a watercolor painter, watercolor uh, artist. And... Um, For instance, uh, people from no, those whom I described as underground um, did not uh, used to uh, going there. They tried to avoid except one or two, like Yuri Zlotnikov, who Then, then announced that he started with Favorsky. No, he didn't. Uh, they were just short visits. Mm, and it is one way. Another way was uh, organize their artistic life in Leningrad. There were no, how to say it, salient points like Favorsky, who was unique, like Falk, who was unique, like Tatlin, but circles, schools, like Filonov schools, for instance, Malevich school, uh, which preserved, which um, survived, And it was like a general teacher or collective teacher. It was another way. And about Tatlin, uh, last years, um, people who knew him told that he was uh, left behind in 1932 and nobody needed him, though he worked for theater a lot, for theater decorations, and uh, over these constructions like Lettatlin. But um, some people um, wrote and um, said orally that last years he mm, was very, he was in no need 
he was in depression it there were the terrible years of stalin regime from 94 98 when all museums of foreign art were closed when collections were disbanded when all constructivist art and early avant-garde was in the cellars so uh people just museum visitors could not um know anything further than uh the midst 19th century so impressionist no rochenko no totally no yes as we heard already and totlin um was in in crisis in depression maybe that's why he started to to develop his third model of letatlin and only his former pupils like alexey zelensky they were two more uh, were accepted to to be with him but favorsky and his red house was open to public it was also well maybe it's a topic <laughs> for longer discussion of course i wanted to say just something about the the soviet avant-garde which is uh, of course a big topic in the kind of intellectual debates around operismo um some very prominent um historian of architecture and of art manfredo tafuri roy book which which was deeply inspired by operismo and he also addresses the the soviet avant-garde and so maybe this is just let's say one um aspect the, the debate was more complicated than that but they were very critical of the soviet avant-garde uh because well for many reasons but i think one of the main points was that um how can i say well one of i guess the main point was well they the avant-garde it's it's a kind of uh something that you find in Boris Groj in his books about 20 years later so the the the, the argument was well they wanted to change society uh and so they idea to the five years plan when stalin came to power um but then they had to kind of could not accept that their kind of bourgeois idea of, of utopia was not compatible with what the regime was trying to do the regime was trying to implicate artists in a, a project of change um so there was it's what Boris tried to do was a kind of class critique of the Soviet Union and say well you were bourgeois artists with a very bourgeois idea of utopia and now you can change society but it's not the way you would like to do it as an artist and so it's it's this kind of reading of the Soviet Union um yes i i kind of but agree and um as for Boris Groys i'd say uh we should take him also critically especially gesamtkunstwerk stalin yes where he um argues that the avant-garde um, was very helpful in terms of even in terms of making political revolution that the avant-garde prepared the ground for the large stalin project of uh, uh, life as art or art as life but um it's kind of um simplifying because before boris groys uh, the first book on totalitarian art was published um in english uh with the title totalitarian Totalitarian art, excuse me, uh, by Igor Glamstok, and um, 
he uh, showed not that early avant-garde prepared Stalin and was killed by Stalin. It was, uh, as he argues, it was the favorite legend of the second avant-garde, that the first avant-garde uh, was stopped, was catched and captured by Stalin, and then something else started. Uh, on this ground, but something else. But Igor Glanschstock shows that early avant-garde had all elements which developed into Stalin, as he puts it, mega machine of socialist realism, of totalitarian art. Besides, he compares um, Soviet Germ and German art of the Third Reich and Mussolini's art, and then adds a part on art of China also. So he thinks that uh, three main uh, regimes had many in common because it's totalitarian art independently. Uh, and that's, um, we, we uh, can take, yes, early avant-garde critically, yes, in terms of political context, of course, uh, but in terms of um, artistic context, it's quite interesting that almost all magazines like the thing magazine wish uh like some left um, journals and magazines were printed in germany uh like mm, early avant-garde uh was looking for the way to go there through bauhaus to say not to stay in Russia, only futurists, or mainly futurists, uh, stayed in Russia. But uh, the main part of constructivist artists, uh, the majority of them, or half of them, and the majority of their heritage in print, in archives, in papers, um, left in the West, and Malevich, when he was called by Soviet government to, to come back, and he already understood and uh, was getting the idea of what was happening in Soviet Russia, he left his archive in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I think it's it's very interesting to, I mean, especially Paula is looking at uh, left. Uh, I think the reception of the, let's say, Soviet avant-garde, Russian is not correct, the Soviet avant-garde is extremely interesting. And I think this is something, some so, story in sea left to kind of, dig into because it's also to a certain extent a western kind of mirror you know you want to see the positive side of history that has been repressed but the reality is a bit more complicated um and i think in and, and this is something you know i'm not not in a position to say something more specific but i think uh, it's also that, that this kind of heroic vision of the Soviet avant-garde is also Western image that emerged in the 70s. Uh, and I think, yeah, maybe we should be quite critical of that, this, you know, black and white image. Even in the, uh, after 24, when yeah. they immigrated yeah. to the USA, <laughs> I'd say yes in the 17, but um, 
early in uh, the 1924-30s when part of constructivists immigrated to the USA, uh, both from Bauhaus, uh, Gabo and uh, Pevsner and Tsatkin and uh, partly Archipenka, he was just a side of it. And uh, for instance, Archipenka worked in the American Bauhaus with Mahoy Nad. Yes? On the materials. Yes. Developing new materials. Yeah. Yes. I, I think this is also another story. I think there's a, the 19... I mean, it was also um, the MoMA uh, version of constructivism, which was extremely apolitical. And Gabo and Pevsna, they were the, the least political members of constructivism. But uh, so I think there are many stories and many kind of misreadings. Yes, many levels yeah, and yeah. many perspectives on all this, of mm. course. And this museum story, of course. Yes. Yeah. But there are, there are, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a big, uh, you know, fan of Soviet avant-garde, and uh, there are more and more books coming out now. And uh, I don't know, maybe and maybe this is also, with the war and everything, something that will come to an end soon, because, of course, it's very difficult to carry out research in, in Russian archives. So I think there'll be a gap in the scholarship at some point, you know. There were new books like 20 years ago when the archives were open and, and now maybe a new phase will begin. I don't know, this is just my hypothesis. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, we have touched many uh, different subjects and very interesting subjects. So. I'm really thankful for uh, Professor Jacopo Galimbert and Professor uh, Olga Rusinova for their lectures today, for their um, patience to answer all our questions, and also thankful for the students who came, especially for those who didn't leave. And uh, so I'd like to bring this round table to an end. And thank you very much. And a last round of applause, please, for our guests. Thank <laughs> you.